So how to build a smart digital society together? Well, first of all, the problems of the world are complex. We are faced with financial crisis, with crime, with conflict, war, and climate change, to mention just a few of the global problems. How can we respond to all these challenges we are faced with? Could we, now using big data, could we rule the world like a wise king, like a benevolent dictator? That's a question that has been asked sometimes. Could we build a crystal ball? Or could we even build something like a digital magic wand to change the course of the world, to influence people's behaviors? Well, if we wanted to do such a thing, what would one need to do? First of all, we would need a lot of power, and for this we would need a lot of knowledge, of course. And how to get that knowledge? Well, one has to collect a lot of data, and one needs to find a reason to collect all these data. Now, once these data are collected, <coughs> what could one do with it? One might actually use the personal data to control our behavior. And it would work like this. One would give personalized information to everyone, and in this way, one might influence our behavior. And this is actually something which is also under discussion, and it comes sometimes under the name nudging or liberal paternalism. And uh, the technology that's being used for this is persuasive technology. And so if there is a combination of the use of big personal data with nudging, I sometimes call it big nudging. Well, the question is, are we already remotely controlled? And the other question is, would we be put punished if we don't behave according to the instructions given to us with personalized information? And probably, yes. Because the idea that stands behind this is going back to Skinner, who invented this Skinner box. And so Skinner put all sorts of animals into these boxes and provided them with rewards and punishment, depending on what they did, to make them do certain kinds of things. Now, this time, humans are basically the pets experimented with, in a sense. We are actually living in a golden cage, which is called the filter bubble. So everyone sees the world in a different way because everyone is presented with different kinds of personal data. And in fact, now it also becomes possible to reward and punish people for what they do by personalized pricing. And you all know people are now talking about predictive policing. It means that in perspective, even what you haven't done so far, what you might do in the future with a certain probability might be punished or rewarded. And it might also matter actually what your neighbors are doing. That means you wouldn't even have much influence on that. I don't know who would like to live in such a society. Yeah, I didn't expect that people would be too excited about it. But it's good to discuss it, uh, because it turns out that this kind of system is feasible, and the technology does exist, and what is being done is deep learning algorithms are being used to learn about every one of us and how we behave, what we do, you know, what we're interested in, learn about our emotions and how we can be manipulated. And here's just one example, standing for many others, uh, the China Brain Project that's being promoted by Baidu in cooperation with the military. And uh, so they apply deep learning on data that they collect from everyone's behavior. And in fact, uh, very recently, uh, we learned more about the plan. And this plan basically foresees that 
every citizen would get a score, a one-dimensional score that depends on what you do. In particular, uh, what you click in the internet and whether your opinions fit the government's opinion well. And depending on that, you would basically get cheaper credit, you would uh, get a visa to travel to some other country, or you wouldn't get that, or you couldn't be employed in certain kinds of jobs. Well, this technology is also being used actually by companies and um, in other countries, so this is not to blame China in any way. It's just we need to be aware this kind of technology exists and we need to decide whether it's good to use it this way or not. And in order to decide this, we need to discuss how well would such a system work. It's often suggested that big data is the universal tool to understand and govern the world. But actually, this is not the case, right? Even if we would have the data of all these bullets flying in a war, we wouldn't still understand what would really cause the war in the first place. If we look into big data, we will always find patterns, very similar to when we look into the sky, we see patterns too. And scientists believe these patterns actually don't have a meaning for our life. If we don't give it a meaning, you know. Here is another example demonstrating spurious correlation. The number of serial killers as a function of chocolate consumption. <laughs> if this was a meaningful correlation, that means a causality, then living in Switzerland would be very dangerous and most likely you would have moved already to another place. Of course, that doesn't have any meaning and there are lots of these spurious correlations in big data. Another application, of course, is uh, trying to separate good from bad with you know, terrorists from good citizens, uh, expensive patients uh, from <coughs> medical patients that don't produce a lot of costs and so on. But usually what you have is point clouds that are overlaid and you cannot clearly separate them from each other. So there will always be errors, false alarms, and alarms that don't go off, and that means, yeah, mistakes will happen. And in particular, there's also a risk of discrimination. So, for example, your health insurance takes big data about your food consumption. Then even without an intention to do so, they would probably implicitly separate Christians from Jews, from Muslims, you know, Europeans, from Asians, from Americans, they would all pay different prices and this is what we don't want to happen. So really there are a lot of traps in big data analytics and how we use it. And that's why we need to say the magic formula that more data is more knowledge and more knowledge is more power, more power is more success, this magic formula doesn't work. In particular, one concern is that powerful tools enable serious misuse. Cybercrime is exploding. It costs us three trillions a year at the moment, but uh, there is an exponential increase. So in a couple of years, it could be a much bigger number, actually. This is out of control at the moment. And in fact, basically all companies and all institutions, including the military, including the White House, the Pentagon, the German Bundestag, you know, all of them were hacked. So why should it be possible to build such a control system for society and that one wouldn't be hacked? Now these powerful systems attract, of course, criminals, extremists, terrorists, and so on. And how would we protect ourselves from such a use of such powerful systems? So that's the concern that we need to have. Besides, there is this illusion of control. 
Even though it's true that uh, people's behavior can be predicted often with a high probability and accuracy because we have repetitive weekly schedules, many of us at least. This doesn't mean that we could predict the future of the world. And the reason is that even if we would know everything about every single person in this room and all over the globe, interactions between people changes everything. As we know, if you, know, you meet somebody, you fall in love with that person, that changes your life. And if you're influential, that will perhaps change the history of your country or the entire world. And of course we know that since a long time there are systems that show chaotic dynamic or turbulent dynamic and that means no matter how much data you have you cannot predict the future exactly. You can make probabilistic predictions but sometimes they're wrong and in particular the more you want to predict into the future the higher the likelihood that it wouldn't work well. And in fact it turns out that many of those problems that we haven't solved in the world result from complexity and from systemic instabilities. And this is not a serious problem but it demonstrates really well what's going on. By the way, a movie from a Japanese colleague, Yuki Tsubiyama, thank you very much for providing it to me. The issue really is, even if we would be able to see all the thoughts of every driver here, we couldn't prevent the traffic jam from forming. Yes, mass surveillance wouldn't help against traffic jams. And why is this? Because there are mathematical formulas that allow us to understand this phenomenon which basically says that if the density is above a certain level then small variations of the speeds would actually amplify would cause a domino effect and in the end we have a result that nobody wanted even though everyone has good technology good education all the information it seems to take to do that job and the very best intentions to avoid that situation. But that's typical for systemic instability that a system would sooner or later get out of control and produce an outcome that nobody wanted. These are the problems that we haven't solved in the world. And this contains supply chain instability, it includes booms and recessions, it includes crowd disasters, it includes crime, so you can see these oscillations that indicate instability, and it includes strategies of the commons where cooperation would be favorable for everyone, but unfortunately in that situation cooperation is unstable as the free traffic flow was unstable in the ring I showed you before. Conflict is such an example Revolutions is such an example, and we could find many more. These are the problems that we need to work on, and these are the problems that require complexity science to understand them and to manage them better in the future. Now, in interdependent systems, you can have the situation that a single local perturbation can mess up your entire system. Now this looks like a funny experiment for a rainy weekend, but in fact these kind of phenomena happen in real life. So look at this Frank Schweitzer, my colleague, with his team has produced that video and it shows all the bankruptcies after Lehman Brothers got gone bankrupt. So basically hundreds of banks went bankrupt and hundreds of billions of dollars were lost because of a cascading effect of the kind that we saw before. This is a systems design issue and a management issue. And in fact there are other cascading effects that we are well aware of 
that trouble us even 15 years later. September 11 started a huge cascade, you know, including wars in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, that produced a spreading of tension towards neighboring countries, which destabilized the entire area, and it might have been also one of the reasons for the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring destabilized, as you know, many countries in Northern Africa and in the Middle East. So, over thousands of kilometers, we had instabilities of these societies, and in particular, people are worried about the situation in Syria. So basically, social order broke down, and also in the entire area around. And so that's one of the reasons why Islamic State is spreading and why we now fear terrorism in many countries and why we have a refugee crisis. But no matter what we try to do in order to get control of this, now we can't stop this. So now this is really an example for a cascade showing that we totally lost control. Even though those countries involved are extremely powerful, so we need to conclude that top-down control of the world does not work well enough. We rather need more wisdom rather than more power. Why can I say this? Our society and our economy are complex dynamical systems. Our body is true, and we know a lot about how our body works. If we're ill, then we take medicine. But we know it really matters what medicine we take, how much we take, when we have to take it, then there are interaction effects with other medicines, side effects, one medicine might work for you, but not for you, and all these kind of things. All of that is true for complex dynamical systems such as our society and economy too. So if we really want to improve the world, then we need to use this kind of knowledge. We need to go about it in a different way. Minimally invasive measures are advised. And why is this? Well, it's true actually that with all the data that we have today, we can now take evidence-based decisions. That's fantastic. But as you can see, there is a distance between the data volume and the processing power, a gap that opens up more and more, actually, exponentially. And that means a smaller and smaller fraction of data can ever be processed. Most of it is dark data we can never process. And it means we need to know what piece of the data we need to look at and process. In many cases, however, our attention is focused on the wrong things. And then we do mistakes even though we have all these massive amounts of data. Now there's another issue that as we go on networking the world, there are more and more opportunities to create new products and services and systems. And that's fantastic, of course, but there's a factorial explosion of systemic complexity and it even overtakes the amount of data you will ever have. As a result, top-down control will work less and less. We need to have a new paradigm which is distributed control. And that also means if we translate that into how we run our societies and economies, it means more participation of people. Something that one could call democracy 2.0. So we could think of an evolution of government principles and going from top-down control towards uh, two-way communication between government and the people, and then a multi-way communication and personalized services, 
and eventually also platforms that enable citizens to contribute to better neighborhoods, better cities, better workplaces, you know, and smarter societies. So this is really citizen empowerment. Civil society will become more and more important really to solve the problems that we have. So we need to learn how to bring the best ideas of many minds together. Because the world is too complex for a single mind and even too complex for the biggest supercomputer. So we need to combine that knowledge and the ideas. And we can do that with online deliberation tools that we need to build where we can collect these many ideas and sort them and uh, basically come up with different perspectives on a complex problem and then try to integrate them to come up with good solutions. So my opinion on artificial intelligence is that humans would become nodes in a global network of intelligences and a huge ecosystem of ideas. But the world would not be run by one big supercomputer. It's really, as we have combinatorial complexity and problems of all kinds, we need to combine intelligence of many people and artificial intelligences in adaptive ways depending on the problem. Combinatorial complexity requires combinatorial intelligence, which is distributed collective intelligence. In order to support this, yeah, we need to be able uh, to, uh, in, in a multicultural world, which is highly diverse and complex, uh, we need to engage in interoperability. And in fact, there are tools today that help us to communicate with other cultures. So you can download an app where you speak in your smartphone in one language and it's translated in real time into another language and that helps to overcome of course, cultural barriers. So rather than remote control of citizens, we should engage in building digital assistance that support people in self-control and taking better decisions. If everyone takes better decisions, then it's good for the world, right? And a nice example is of course a GPS route guidance system where People can turn it on and off. They can say, what is my goal? And then they can choose between different options. This device advises people, it assists them to reach their goals in an optimal way. And we can build these kind of devices for all sorts of situations. Devices that support situational awareness, so, uh, devices that support interaction between people and between companies, devices that protect people from making mistakes and devices that support exchange and engagement in value creation. Now I think it's very important that we engage in discovering the success principles that are behind all of our different cultures in the world. Each culture has thousands of success principles, but most of them we couldn't even spell out. They're not explicit, but we should try to make them explicit because then we could combine these different success principles in new ways and create new social and economic value because when it comes to collective intelligence, an important insight is that the best solution is actually not the best. If you combine different solutions, that usually is superior to a single best solution. I mean, diversity wins. Diversity is extremely important. And that's why we need to engage in this. And then together, if we have enough interoperability, we can grow an information and innovation ecosystem. The more services and products are around, the more services and products it would enable, in this way, exponential innovation creation of jobs. So what I think we need to do is we should build 
a catalyst actually for social and economic value creation. And NervousNet is trying to do such a thing. So it's built on Internet of Things technology and uh, is using in particular our smartphones because these smartphones contain about 15 sensors that can measure, that measure different kinds of things. In our everyday use, we are actually not making much use of these sensors, but we can open them up for all sorts of uses. We can actually connect smartphones with each other to build a global measurement system and then collectively measure things. So a single phone would, for example, have these acceleration patterns measured by the acceleration sensors. Now, if all our smartphones would shake at the same time, what would that mean? Well, of course, that's an earthquake. And in that kind of situation, then we would like our friends and colleagues and family to be warned immediately. So they would have some seconds to get into a safe space. Now, surely, we would like to have such a system, but we'd like to have a system that we can trust. Trust is enormously important for our economy, for our society, and so how would we build this? Well, I think actually informational self-determination is really important for this. So let people decide which of those centers they want to open, and whether they want to use that data just for themselves and that data stays on their smartphone or whether they want to share these data. Let's build personal data stores where all data about a person is sent and you can administer this data and say I'm happy to share this data with companies, I'm happy to share this data with my friends I am happy to share those data just with my doctor and um, there's some data I don't want to share at all. I think that's okay and it creates trust to give this decision power to people. And so my proposal is to run the Internet of Things as a citizen web and to build it as we build Linux for example. Now Linux is the basis of Android, of uh, Apple iOS, no, of Linux, so this was an extremely powerful open system. Same thing with the internet, all open protocols. So now why don't we build the Internet of Things in a similar way? Similar also to Wikipedia, to OpenStreetMap. This is a powerful principle. And apart from measuring our world in real time, we can use this data also to create real-time feedback and in this way support self-organization almost like magic. You know? We can make the invisible hand work by creating the kind of right kind of feedback. So for example, we can get rid of this terrible stop-and-go waves that we've seen before. And uh, first, this simulation basically shows you I did something wrong. That we can actually simulate and reproduce the stop and go words that we see in reality. <coughs> and now we'll elevate ourselves from this car in order to see the reason. And in fact, it turns out there is an on ramp, and a few cars are trying to get on the freeway, which produces small variations in the speeds. And those small variations are amplified and create a domino effect and finally the stop and go waves. Now, if we equip these cars, which we did uh, no, not only in simulation but also in tests with radar sensors and measure distances and relative velocities and let the cars drive in an automatic way. Now, we did that when nobody was talking about Google cars. Now, you can see that we can get rid of the traffic jam. So the issue is real-time measurement, real-time feedback and mechanism design. And in principle we can do the same thing to reduce recessions, I believe. We can do the same thing to overcome congestion in urban areas and to build 
intelligent production systems using self-organization principles and smart grids. So the issue is really that we wouldn't try to turn society into a big clockwork where every single person would do something that basically execute instructions that that person would get, but instead we would have many more or less autonomous systems that however are well coordinated through the support of digital assistants. And that will create actually massive increased efficiency, self-organizing, self-improving systems, and it's compatible with democratic principles and free entrepreneurship. But by measuring the externalities of the interactions, we can create a better environmental impact and means more sustainability, and also a better social interaction, more cooperation, less conflict. And what does it take? Well, basically, what Future ICT proposed. You know, to build a planetary nervous system, to build interactive virtual worlds, participatory platforms, and a multi-dimensional exchange system. And in fact, I should say that within just one year, if we look back, there were dramatic changes in the world. Just to remember what happened since I've spoken at Google about a year ago about the world after big data, building the self-regulating society. You know, I was talking at, at groups with people about making up their internet system, the internet of things as a citizen web. And so what happened since then, Google wants to advance the internet of things with open innovation. Yeah? Interesting. I'm not claiming that all of that was triggered by my talk, but anyway, also Google has reconfigured itself, you know, it decentralized itself to some extent. I've been talking in South Korea about Governance 3.0, been in Japan several times. Um, I have uh, published about uh, how to build smart and resilient societies. Uh, which really requires decentralization, modularization, diversity, and so on. I have published about the societal, economic, ethical, and legal challenges of the digital revolution. And now, within just a few weeks, there are really dramatic changes. So, in nature, we have this. Uh, article about interdisciplinarity, how to capitalize collaboration, September 16. Another article, how to solve the world's biggest problems, same issue. Then, again in nature, September 22nd, democracy is not an inconvenience. UN General Assembly on the 25th to the 28th, the Pope um, in speaking about diversity, bottom-up engagement. The presidents of the USA and China say, we need to, to try more democracy. September 29, Apple announces it's uh, going to protect our privacy better. Uh, September 30, I believe, um, the government wants you to help it to do science experiments. This is about citizen science, about participatory science. Then on the 6th of October, announced more or less on the 23rd of uh, September, a new paradigm in terms of data exchange, safe harbor needs to be renegotiated, also exchange of European data with US companies needs to be renegotiated. October 7, crowdsource research, many hands make pipe work again in nature. So within just four weeks, we're seeing an entirely new paradigm. And if you read this book, maybe you get an idea of what else might happen in the future. So why don't we do this all together? Thank you very much.